What an honor to be with you guys. I love you so much. Third time to Ghana. I'm part of your family now. I am Ghana, and I love your pastor. I love your church. I love what God's doing through Pastor Gideon and just through this whole ministry. And every, every year for the last three years, I've been so blessed. Every time I come, I just get so encouraged, on fire, filled with more passion. And I love who he brought in this year. I met Pastor Ray Bevins when I was 10 years old, 1995, 96. My brother and I went to Wales with my father, who was a pastor, and he preached. My dad preached for Pastor Ray, and I still remember him. And so getting to see him again 30 years later just feels amazing. Of course, we love Bradley and his friend Demetrius, Keon Henderson, the whole crew. Can we give your prophet, your pastor Gideon, a big hand for bringing in an amazing group of speakers, pastors, leaders, opening the pulpit up so we could preach. And the worship is always incredible. I love the worship team. I cry every time. Woo! -wee! So good. I brought my brother, John. He's on the second row. He's single. In case you're interested, he's an awesome man of God. Are you ready for the word tonight? All right, you can be seated. If you got a Bible, go to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. And if our keys man can stay up and play, thank you so much. I want to talk to you tonight about faith in the wild. Faith in the wild. In Daniel chapter 3, there was three men who had been in exile and captivity in Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar was the king. And in Daniel chapter 3, he sets up this huge golden image in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And he brings in this man, he says, when the music plays, he calls all the mayors, the governors, the leaders, the teachers, the people of every nation, every tribe... And he says, when you hear the music playing, everyone, everybody say everyone, everyone must bow down. It says in verse 4, nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. This was not a suggestion. This was not if you feel like it. This was a commandment. If you don't do this, you don't just get canceled on YouTube. You don't just lose followers on Instagram, you don't just lose a job or a salary, you lose your life. If you don't do what they're saying to do. We're living in a time right now where the world is demanding the church to bow down. The world is demanding Christians to bow down to whatever the government tells us is appropriate, is okay, is, has been permitted by the governmental leaders or if it's not the government it's pop culture right now there's an information war happening during the middle of a war that's happening in Israel against Hamas and the information war is trying to convince the world that Israel is the bully that Israel doesn't have a right to fight but the land was originally given to Israel before there was ever a religion called Islam before there was ever a nation called Palestine, God gave the land to Abraham. Abraham gave it to Isaac. Isaac gave it to Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. But we're living in a time where the news wants to tell us what we should believe. The news wants the world to hate the Jewish people. The news wants the world to bow down to a virus. The news wants the world, pop culture wants the church to bow down to a pride flag celebrating lesbians, gays, homosexuality. The news and pop culture wants the church to shh on any morals, any values. You can inspire people, but don't give people the truth. Truth sounds like hate to people who hate the truth. We're living in a time where people hate the truth of God's word. People are rejecting morals and values found in the Word of God. 
And so Nebuchadnezzar stands as a shadow. The Old Testament stories are always shadows of what's coming in the future. King Nebuchadnezzar stands as a shadow of 2023, what it looks like to live in Ghana, in Accra, what it looks like to live in America, what it looks like to live in Europe, in England, where 200,000 people stand in the streets shouting against Israel, hating the Jewish people. What does it look like to be a Christian in 2023? What does it look like to follow Jesus when the world is telling you, you need to have a tame faith? You need to have a faith that's government permissible. You need to have a faith that fits in with pop culture. As long as you do what we all do, we're okay with you. But the second you don't bow, watch this. He says, every nation, every tongue, every tribe must bow down. When you hear the music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Verse 6, whoever does not bow down and worship what everyone else is worshiping and bowing down to will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. But Isaiah the prophet, he knew a time would come where there would be fires that people would go through. In Isaiah 43, he says this to the people of God, to the children of God, caught in exile. Verse 1. But now this is what the Lord says. The God of Israel, the God who created Jacob, the God who watches over Israel. Do not fear, Pastor Gideon, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, Joseph. You are mine, Empowerment Worship Center. And when you pass through the waters, Paul Doherty, I will be with you. And when you go through the fire, Demetrius, John, all the, the children of God, when you go through the fire, when you go through the rivers, when you walk through dangerous situations, you will not be burned up. The water will not sweep over you. The flames will not set you ablaze. For the Lord your God goes before you and behind you. The Holy One of Israel, the God who ransomed you out of Egypt, stands with you. God never promised us a perfect life, but he did promise us a perfect savior. He did promise to be with us through every trial, through every fire, through every storm. We are not alone. I remember when I was in Africa as a teenager, I came to Tanzania in 2008, and we were on a safari ride, and we were out in the wild, and I remember seeing lions just walking out in the wild. We were driving a Jeep through the safari. If we have those pictures of the safari animals, I want you to see these. Because they had these lions out there. And they had giraffes walking out in the field. They had zebras out there. It was gorgeous seeing the zebras, the giraffes, the lions all together out there. Seeing the leopard walking out there, seeing the elephants out in the wild. They were free. They were free. They were bold. They were strong. They were confident. And then I went home in America, and I was hiking with my wife in the mountains of northern America, Montana, Wyoming, and we saw bears out in the wild. Bears just roaming through the woods out in the wild. And I couldn't wait to show my five kids. So I got home and I said, boys and girls, you got to see. Give it up for Pastor Keon and his wife. They just got here. Yeah. But church, let me tell you something. When I told my kids about these animals, they said, Daddy, can we see these animals? I said, yes, you can. So I took them to the best place outside of a safari. I took them to the zoo of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And when I took them to the zoo, I want you to see what the animals looked like behind the cages in the zoo. Now just look at that lion for a second. Everybody say, aww. Now show a picture of the bear behind the cage. This is, this is really sad. Look at that guy. There's a big difference between a lion that lives in the wild, free, 
bold, confident, courageous. Go back to that lion sleeping. Because the longer a lion sits in a cage, he starts to lose his passion. He starts to lose his confidence. He starts to lose his appetite. The longer he sits in a cage, the sooner he begins to fall asleep. Bears were meant to live in the wild. But go back to that bear, that bear that was sitting in the zoo. I showed my kids and I said, boys, I wish you could see the bear that I saw in Montana. It was wild. It was free. It was walking and it was huge. And they said, that, that doesn't look like the bear you described. That bear looks sad. That bear looks discouraged. That bear looks civilized. Who or what has caged you? Some of us in this room have lost what we used to have. We've lost it to the fear of man. We are afraid to take a stand because if we do, we might be canceled. We might lose some friends. We may not be accepted at our job. Some of us have been caged by shame. We've made mistakes. And the devil loves to keep that finger pointed at you in a cage of shame. So we stay in the cage. I can't, I can't be used by God again because I've made too many mistakes. I can't stand up for righteousness because who am I? I've blown it in my life. So I'll stay in my cage and I'll watch as Keon takes a stand, as Bishop Gideon takes a stand, as Ray Bevins takes a stand. But I can't take a stand because I've, I've made too many mistakes, Paul. I've lost my righteousness. No, no, no. The blood of Jesus makes you righteous. Not who you are, not what you've done, but by what Jesus did on the cross. Come out of that cage, my man. Get out of that cage of shame. Some of us have been caged by political pressure. Paul, we just got to fall in line here. We can't take a stand. We can't say anything about Israel right now. We can't say anything about marriage between a man and a woman. We can't talk like that. We'll be shut down if we take a stand. So we're going to stay in our cage and we're going to preach a nice, sweet little Christian message that doesn't offend anybody. Come out of that cage, church. It's time to uncage your faith. Jesus did not come to make us nice, caged, tame Christians. Jesus came to uncage the church, to unleash the potential of the kingdom of God, to make us a dangerous force to the kingdom of darkness. Jesus did not come to domesticate men and women. He didn't come to put Peter in a cage and say, Hey, Peter, you can't be yourself. You can't take a risk. You can't preach. You can't walk on water. Just stay in the cage of what everyone else is telling you to do. No, no, no. Jesus came to uncage Peter. Jesus came to uncage Thomas from his doubt. Jesus came to unleash the kingdom potential inside of a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. He didn't come to put people in a cage of shame. He came to lift people out of the cage that they were put in by religious people. Oh, let's talk about the religious cage. Some of us have been caged by religion and the traditions of church. I can't be who I really am because it doesn't fit in with what every other church is doing, what every other Christian is doing. But Jesus didn't come to make us all carbon copies of another Christian leader or another church. If you were born as an original, don't you die as a copy. In Matthew 11, verse 12, Jesus said, since the days of John the Baptist. Let's talk about faith in the wild. John the Baptist wore a loincloth when he preached. He ate locust and honey. He said, repent! Prepare the way of the Lord. He shouted at kings who could cut his head off. But he was committed to a faith that was dangerous. Jesus said, since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. It's time to uncage your passion. 
Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 16, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Therefore, be wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove. We've got to be smart in the last days, but we are not called to be safe in the last days. The faith that God calls us to walk in is dangerous. It's dangerous. Think about how Jesus lived with a dangerous faith during the wild times when he was alive. He flipped tables over in the temple. He turned water into wine. He turned the party up. He brought Lazarus back to life. He walked into a tomb where a dead man was, brought him back to life. He spit in a man's eyes, rubbed mud in his eyes. He opened deaf ears. He talked to demoniacs. He crossed an entire sea to talk to a man who was mentally and emotionally disturbed. And he spoke straight to the demons. Jesus was unafraid to confront the darkness of his time. He says, the things that I did, you will do an even greater. When I look at the story of Daniel chapter 3, I see a story of men who stood out. Go back to Daniel chapter 3. Look at this in verse, uh, we'll start in verse 7. Daniel 3 verse 7. We're talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel 3 verse 7. As soon as they heard the sound of music, all the nations and the peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold. When I was younger, my teacher used to say, get in line, get in line. Okay. What did she mean? She said, do what everyone else is doing. Get in line. But when everyone got in line, there was three guys who stepped out of line. They were willing to reject a governmental authority for a faith that was stronger than a king who was in a temporary position. Now, I'm all about respecting those that are in authority, but when it contradicts my convictions that come from the Word of God, if I was alive during Hitler's time, you better believe I would not fall in line with Hitler. But we're watching the same spirit of Haman who tried to kill the Jews under Esther, the same spirit of Hitler that tried to start a holocaust, six million Jews killed. Now Hamas, starting the same spirit of hatred and violence. Get in line, get in line. You can't talk about this. No, I'm gonna step out of line because I got something to say. My God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of Israel. He is the God of angel armies. And he did not call me to fit in with what everyone else is telling me to say. At this time, some astrologers came forward and they denounced the Jews. Nothing new is happening today, my friends. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews who refuse to do what you've said. These Jewish people are actually in positions of leadership. You've set them over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those weren't their real names. Those were their Babylon names. Because when they came to Babylon, the first thing they attack is your identity. When you come to Babylon, they change your name first. Then they change your fashion. They say, you gotta dress like us, they're going to change your hair, too. They, they don't let the Jewish people have the same hairdo. You're, we're going to cut your hair to look like us. We're going to dress you like us. We're going to give you names that sound like Babylon. But these Jews had a name that was etched on the soul of their heart. They knew who they were. You can change your hairdo. You can change your fashion. You can even change your name. But you can't change your identity. You're a child of God. The devil can't strip you of the faith that you were born again into. So these men, when they heard the music, they refused to bow. Furious with rage, in verse 13, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said, these men, these men are the men who refuse to bow. Everyone else is bowing down, but these men stand up. What's got you caged? What's got you, what's got you shrinking back? What was it that made these guys 
stand up. They had character. Their, their convictions were not changed because of the conditions they were in. Their conditions did not shape their convictions. Their convictions would shape the condition they were in. The culture did not change their character. Their character changed the culture. They had a, they had a heart of gold. By the way, you've got to have a heart on fire if you're going to make it through the fire. They had a heart on fire, ablaze with a passion for God. And so they stood when everyone else bowed. In 2020, we, we took a stand as a church to, to do services outside in the parking lot and rooftop services. And people told us, the mayor called me, said, I'm going to shut you down. I said, okay. I said, are you going to feed the hungry in our city? Because no one's feeding them right now. He said, who are you to tell me that? I said, mayor, I respect you. But our church is passing out groceries every week right now. People are getting laid off from their jobs. This was before there was any government handouts. I said, who's going to help them right now? No one wants to go outside. There's a virus out there. Who's going to help them? He said, well, I guess your church is. I said, that's right. That's right. We are. He said, well, I can't protect you when you die. I can't protect you when you die, you idiot. I said, okay. The governor called me. He said, Paul, I heard what you're doing, and I got your back. If the mayor shows up, I'm sending the state national guard. We'll surround your church. You won't get arrested. I said, how'd you get my number? He said, I've got friends in Tulsa. He said, I'm calling the president on this. We got a call from the White House in 2020. Ivanka Trump said, I want to partner with your church to get groceries out to every family that comes, farmers to families. We passed out 16 million bags of groceries. We fed people from Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas, Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska. People drove in from Virginia, California. Why? Because we decided we're not going to bow down just because everyone else is bowing down. What I'm trying to say is you have a choice. You may not think you have a choice, but you have a choice. Now that choice may lead to consequences, and you have to accept that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were committed beyond the benefits. So many people follow Jesus as long as it's safe, as long as he blesses me, as long as I got Ephraim and Manasseh. But what about when the blessing is gone? What about when I'm walking through hard times, can I still stand for Jesus? Because that's where we're headed, my friends. I, I, I reckon the current war might lead to World War III. I reckon that where we're headed right now in the world is accelerating the, the, the potential rise of an antichrist. The rebellion spirit that Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians is already here. People are rejecting truth. People are rejecting a moral compass. People are rejecting a God that, change, that makes them change their lifestyle. People have turned themselves into God. They want, to have, they want to have the rights of what they do and how they do it and what they want to do. But all I'm saying is this. If the church doesn't have a backbone, we're toast. We got to get a spine that says, I will stand for Jesus even if I'm only the one standing. We used to sing a song when I was little. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, Still I will follow Though none go with me Still I will follow No turning back No turning back Don't let your conditions change your convictions You have what you tolerate If you tolerate something today, you'll have it tomorrow. Parents, you have what you tolerate from your kids. If you don't challenge their behavior today, you'll reap the results of what you allow tomorrow. If you don't challenge disrespect in your house towards their mom, you're going to have disrespect later on towards not just mom, dad, teachers, authorities. 
We've got to stop tolerating a spirit of antichrist. We've got to take a stand and say, hold on, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. What gave these men courage and character and competence and compassion and convictions was that they stood together. Your crew determines your view. You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Your crew determines your view. Surround yourself. I love this picture of these lions. Surround yourself with those who are on the same mission as you. Surround yourself with those who are on the same mission as you. Surround yourself with those who have the same appetite of faith. Surround yourself with those who have the same truth compass. Surround yourself with those who are willing to stand when everyone else bows at the sound of music. Surround yourself with those who are on the same mission as you. So the king comes to the, to the young boys and he says, is it true, in verse 14, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods nor worship the image of gold I have set up? Now I'm going to give you one more chance. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the music, you must bow down. And you must worship the image of gold that I have made up that every nation is bowing down to. But if you do not worship my golden image, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Friends, you got to know when to bow and when not to bow. We're living in a time where people are bowing left and right. People are bowing down to hatred People are bowing down to fear. People are bowing down to all kinds of things. And I've made a decision. I refuse to bow to the fear of man. I refuse to bow to the demand from pop culture on which values are acceptable in the church. I refuse to bow to the spirit of anger and slander on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and now X. I refuse to bow to the spirit of dishonor to God or his creation. I refuse to bow to fitting in with everything America promotes. I refuse to bow to compromising my beliefs to make everyone in the church happy. I refuse to bow to what other people say on Google or the reviews that they have about me and my church. I refuse to bow to the idolatry of money and greed. I refuse to bow to the addiction to sin and pleasure. I refuse to bow to negativity toxicity, discouragement, a victim mentality, a defeated mindset. I will bow only to King Jesus. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God which saves our souls. There was a woman in North America who came to speak to 2,000 students in Harvard University. She was a famous atheist. She ridiculed Christianity. Then she ridiculed every religion. She said, religion is just a game. It's just something we use to make ourselves feel good about ourselves. She defied God. She attacked the Bible. She stood for one hour and promoted the anti-Christian movement. She said, embrace with me atheism. It is, it, it is the only way that our world can move forward and stop having wars between Islam and Christianity and Judaic values. And she just attacked all religions, but specifically came for Christianity at Harvard University. She was bold. She said at the end of her speech, I dare anyone to challenge me today. Everyone was silent. She had disproven every argument you could think of. But one freshman girl at Harvard stood up and she began to sing. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his rod. It must not suffer. Come on, you sound amazing, Ghana. You sound amazing.
when this girl began to sing, the atheist speaker, she started shouting at the girl, shut up, shut up, stop singing. But the girl wouldn't stop singing. And the whole place started to stand with this girl. This happened in the early 90s. Oh God, I pray this would happen in 2023 at Harvard, at Yale, at Cambridge, at Stanford. God, at every secular university. Oh God, I pray for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego spirit to rise up, to rise up, to stand. Billy Graham said, when one man takes a stand, the spines of others are stiffened. This is what happens. These three young boys, they looked at King Nebuchadnezzar. I love this. In verse 16, this is when it gets really good. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves. Sometimes you don't need to defend yourself. Sometimes you let your actions do the talking. Me and Keon know about this. Sometimes you don't need to defend yourself. Me and Pastor Gideon know about this. Me and Pastor Ray, my brother John. People will say all kinds of crap about you, but you just don't need to defend yourself. You just keep standing. Just keep standing. Just keep singing. Just keep preaching. Just keep moving. Just keep going. Don't stop. They said, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves about this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace. The God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And we believe he will deliver us. But I love this next verse. But even if he doesn't. But even if he doesn't, we refuse to bow down to your antichrist spirit. We refuse to compromise our beliefs, to keep our jobs, to keep our YouTube channel, to keep our popularity, to gain more followers on Instagram. It's all rubbish to live as Christ and to die as gain. We win either way. You kill us, we win. You don't, we win. That's the beauty of being a believer. You are unstoppable against the devil. Would you sit just for five minutes? I promise I'm almost done. I just want to finish with one last thought here. I, uh, I want you to throw that picture up of that bear behind the cage for a second. Because this was me. This was me. Um, when my dad died, a part of my faith died too. He died suddenly at age 57 from cancer. Our church started losing people by the thousands. My mom stepped in as an interim pastor. She was amazing. She's still my hero, still works at the church. But people rejected her as, as the woman pastor of the church, and people left. And I remember seeing people that I had grown up with leave left and right. I lost it all. I just I started losing faith in people. I couldn't trust anybody. I didn't know who was going to leave me next. I missed my dad. I started questioning this whole healing message that I had heard my dad preach, that God wants to heal you. I was like, no, he doesn't. He didn't heal you, dad. And I prayed for you. I was in the hospital every single day speaking word of faith, word of faith, word of faith, and nothing changed. The chemo took my dad out. He had Kenneth Copeland preaching, praying for him. He had Benny Hinn praying for him. He had Bishop Jakes praying for him. He had Dodie Osteen and Joel Osteen and the whole Osteen family up there praying for him. And I lost my faith. My faith turned into this guy. It was caged, caged by disappointment, caged by just this anger at God. And yet I was still pastoring our college ministry. What? I was leading on stage, but I was bleeding off stage. And I would preach as much as I could what I believed because I still believed that Jesus was real. I still believe he died on the cross. I still believe that he was the savior. I just stopped believing in healing. I stopped believing that God could heal people. And I went through this season where I was just so depressed and sad, and yet I had to preach every week. And then my mom started pulling on me. She said, your dad saw that one day you'd be the pastor, so I need you to start preaching on Saturday nights. I was like, okay, I can preach, but I can't preach every topic because there's certain topics that I just won't go into. 
I wonder how many Christians have settled for a caged version of their faith. Like they still have faith, but it's not faith in the wild. It's faith behind a cage. I'll preach on this, but I won't preach on that. I'll preach on this. I'll believe this, but I can't believe that because of what I've been through. And we allow our experiences to determine our theology. That was me. We went to Dominican Republic in 2010 on a missions trip. It had been four and a half months since my dad died. And I get up and I do an altar call outside. There's all these people who are out on a field in Dominican Republic, Central America. And uh, thousands of people gave their hearts to Jesus. It was beautiful. And then there was a guy there with me. He said, hey, Paul, will you do the healing call? I said, no, I'm tired. He said, but your dad always did the healing call at the crusades. I said, I know, but I'm not my dad. He said, okay, you want me to do it? I said, yeah, you can do it. I remember sitting backstage just with my arms crossed as people came down to get prayer for all kinds of diseases. People came in wheelchairs. And I was just, I was just sitting there with the cynical spirit. I was cynical. I was skeptical. And I was angry, especially when people started getting healed. I was like, no, that's not real. They're actors. They're actors. They got paid to pretend like they just got out of that wheelchair. They weren't in that wheelchair. I just, I, I justified, because when you have an offense towards God, you find all kinds of reasons to try to keep that offense there. And, and you start changing the story of everything. And my brother would talk to me and say, Paul, you remember when so-and-so got healed? And I was like, yeah, but I don't think that was real, man. You remember when this happened in Russia, when we were there with mom and dad in 1992? after the communism wall fell down and they took us to St. Petersburg, Russia and all those people got healed and I was like, yeah, but that was then and I'm still not sure if all those people got healed because if they got healed and they weren't even close with God, why didn't dad get healed? He had like followed Jesus his whole life, gave his heart and soul and body and life for Jesus and I remember just being angry. People would ask me to come pray for their parents or their kids at the hospital. And I always had an excuse. I'd say, I can't go. I can't go right now. Why not? I just got a lot going on. I'm sorry. I always had an excuse. It's not that I didn't have compassion for their family members. It's that I didn't believe that that kind of miracle could happen. I was losing my faith. I was bowing down in a sense. When the music played, I was bowing down to this discouraged spirit, this sense of God can't heal people. God doesn't do that. He can't heal cancer. He can't restore things that are messed up. And then nine months went by. We went to Brazil. We were in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And... Our church was there. Our college ministry was there, 2010. And I had still been depressed. I had been gaining a lot of weight. I had been just um, wanting to sleep in, wanting to stay in bed every day. And yet I still had to preach, and I was preaching with depression. And by the way, if you've ever battled depression, you're not alone, because even Elijah the prophet battled depression and suicide. And Peter walked through his own depression, and John the Baptist walked through depression. Isaiah walked through depression. David in the Bible went through his own depression. All I'm saying is don't, don't, don't think that just because you're struggling with some sense of discouragement or depression that you've lost your Christianity. I think you're probably just feeling caged for a second. But God came to set the captives free. God came to uncage you from whatever has bound you up. But I was in Brazil, and we did an altar call. We were outside, and we were partnering up with this group called the Power Team. Y'all ever heard of the power team? It was a group of guys that were really strong. They would like break bricks and stuff. It was crazy. But the power team was there. They did this whole like feats of strength stuff. And then I preach and then people were getting saved and the power team guy comes up to me and says, you're gonna do a healing call, right? I said, no, I can't do that. He said, uh, what do you mean? I said, I'm too tired. He said, what? I said, yeah, I'm too tired, man. I can't do that. He said, all right, we're gonna break some bricks and stuff. We'll give you some time to think about it. I was like, okay. So they start doing all this kind of strong man stuff. And I walked backstage. And this interpreter from Brazil, he spoke Portuguese and English. He stands next to me and he says, hey, Paul. I said, yeah. He said, can I talk to you? I said, yeah. 
He said, I want you to know that my wife died last week. I said, what? He said, yeah, she died of lymphoma cancer. I said, what? Why are you with us? Why have you been on our team missions trip this whole past week? He said, hold on, before I tell you that. He said, let me tell you something. She was 34 years old. I said, what? I said, that's the same cancer my dad died from, but he was 57. He said, I know. I said, what do you mean you know? I haven't talked about that. He said, I know, but I watched the funeral on YouTube last year. I said, you did? He said, yeah. He said, it was long. It was like four hours long. Your dad had everybody there preaching and speaking on his behalf. I said, yeah. He said, but I didn't care what any of those preachers had to say. I cared what his kids had to say. Because he said, you find out who a man is from their kids, not from other preachers. So he said, I was listening to Sharon, your mom, talk about him. Then I was listening to your sister, Sarah, your sister, Ruthie, your brother, John, and then you, the youngest. He said, do you remember what you said? I said, no, life has been really hard since then. It's been really blurry. We've lost a lot of people. Our church has gone downhill. He said, yeah, but he said, I remember what you said. You said you're going to worship God no matter what. I said, yes, I remember saying that. He said, did you mean it or did you just say it for an applause? I said, I meant it. He said, if you meant it, don't you think it would be an act of worship to go and invite those people to get healed tonight? I said, how can you say that when you know you just lost your wife to cancer and I just lost my dad to cancer? How can you say that these people, that we should go out and pray for them to be healed? He said, because I want to tell you another story. I said, okay. He said, uh, Two days before the chemo took my wife, and it got really bad, the cancer, all of it. She lost her voice. Her body uh, became very, it, it was filled with all the liquids and the fluids, and she didn't look like herself in the end. But he said two days before this, she still had a voice. And she said, Manny, that was his name, Manny. She said, Manny, come here. She's in the hospital. He said, yes, honey, what, what? He said, she said, promise me something. She's holding his hand. He said, yes, anything. She said, no, 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 swear. Swear, Manny, swear to me. He said, yes, of course. She said, no, I need you to say you'll do it before I tell you what it is. He was like, okay. Okay, I swear, I promise I'll do it. What is it? She said, swear to me that when I'm gone, he said, no, 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 no. You're not going anywhere. You're going to live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. She said, stop, stop, Manny. I don't have much strength. When I'm gone, he said, no, 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 I'm not losing you. You're going to get healed. She said, no, Manny. When I'm gone, promise me that you won't stop believing that God is still the healer. Promise me that you won't stop believing that God is still the healer. And he's crying. He says, babe, babe, no, no. She said, I'm going to die. He said, no, 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 no. You know you're not. She said, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to meet Jesus. I'm tired, Manny. I'm tired. Just promise me that you won't stop believing. He's still the healer. Promise me, Manny. He said, okay, I promise you. I promise you. He said, I made that promise. And he said, I've been with your team for the last week, and I've watched you, Paul. You have not prayed for anyone to get healed. He said, now, I'm not trying to shame you or condemn you. But I promise you, God is still the healer. He said, listen, sometimes we get to see the miracle. Sometimes we get to be the miracle. He said, you lost your dad. I lost my wife. But what if God wants to use two wounded men, two men with scars to go and bring healing to people that need hope tonight? What if God wants to use us with our tears and our brokenness and our disappointment to pray for people to get healed? He said, would you go with me on that stage? I said, well, now I don't have a choice. Yes, I'll go. And I was crying, and he said, listen, 
He reminded me of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said, you remember that one part when they said, even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't heal, he's still the healer. Even if he doesn't deliver us, he's still the deliverer. Even if he doesn't provide finances for us, he's still Jehovah Jireh. He is, let's stop letting our experiences shape our theology. Let's start banking our theology on the nature and the character of who God is according to his word. He said, otherwise we're going to be on a roller coaster of emotional theology. Always up and down based on what we're walking through. But God is still good, even when life isn't. God is still good. So I went out on that stage, and he started holding my hand. He said, you ready for this? I was like, yeah. I gave the worst healing altar call ever. It was lousy. I was like, if you want to get healed, I'm not promising anything. I was crying. I was like, I don't know if he can do it. I really don't know if he can. (sighs) But if you want to try it, you could come down to the stage and we'll pray for you. It was the worst altar call you've ever heard in your life. You would be like, this kid does not belong in ministry. But people started coming. A lot of people started coming. And I was mad. I was like, they're going to all be disappointed. This is all not going to go good. It's going to be terrible. It's my fault. My prayers don't work, all this stuff. And, and Manny looks at me. He says, you ready for this? I said, yeah. We started praying for people like faith in the wild. We started just laying hands on people and people started getting healed. And with each healing, I had to step back because I was like, wow, that's real. I didn't pay these people. They aren't actors. Unless the power team paid them, I don't think they did. And then I was like, I'm so glad that happened. I just wish it happened for you, dad. I'm so glad it happened for this woman down here, but I just wish he would have got healed too. But it was like with each healing, God was healing my heart. God was changing my heart. God was unbreaking. He was uncaging me. Go to that bear that's out in the wild. Switch to that lion that's out in the wild. Let's get rid of this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was finding my faith. Go to the bear that's out in the wild. I want you to see that bear. I feel like there's a bear that wants to come loose in some of y'all. God says it's time to get free from whatever has caged you, whatever has been holding you back, whatever has been weighing you down. I started praying for people. They started getting healed. Then I looked at Manny. I felt the Holy Spirit say, pray for people with cancer. I said, if there's anyone here tonight with cancer, come down to the stage. He looks at me and he's like, are you serious, bro? It's like, yeah, now I'm the guy that's challenging you. He's like, okay, and he says it in Portuguese. People come down with tumors. Tumors dissolved. Lump, tumorous lumps on a woman's chest dissolved. People who had cancer the next week told their pastor. They went to the doctor, and the cancer was gone. All of a sudden, I started realizing I have been limiting my faith because of what I walked through with my dad and God wants to move through his church in an uncaged way. God wants to move through you in an uncaged way. So I love how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they tell the king, you could throw us in the furnace, but we refuse to bow down. And so the king ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. His attitude towards them changed. He heated up the furnace seven times hotter than usual. He commanded the strongest soldiers to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, their turbans, and other clothes, they were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames killed the soldiers who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men who were tied up fell into the blazing furnace and King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and he asked his advisors weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire he said yes majesty he said look I see four men walking around in the fire unbound, uncaged unharmed and the fourth looks like God himself Nebuchadnezzar approached the blazing furnace and he shouted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. 
People are watching when you go through the fire. People are watching to see what happens when you're thrown into a fire, when you walk through a trial. What they don't understand is that God goes before you. He stands beside you. He comes behind you. And the people that hated you, the people who tried to burn you, what was sent to break you will become your breakthrough. What was sent to to end your faith is about to propel your faith. What was sent to destroy your life is actually going to deploy your life for God's kingdom purpose, for a kingdom assignment. I want you to stand your feet all over this place. I want to pray for you. Lord, I just pray, God, for a spirit of faith to rise up in this room. God, I pray, Lord, that we would have that same faith as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A willingness to stand up when others bow down. A willingness to speak truth when no one else will. Lord, a willingness to keep moving forward even when fires are before us. God, I pray, Lord, that we would have the faith that says, even if he doesn't, even if it doesn't go my way, even if my prayers don't get answered, even if I don't see the miracle, I'm going to be the miracle. I'm going to stand on the word of God. I'm going to let the word of God do the talking. I'm going to stand on the truth of God's character, his nature, what he said in scripture. I'm going to release the things that I don't understand. The secret things belong to the Lord. So God, I'm going to trust in you because real faith begins where understanding ends. Real faith begins when I don't understand it, but I choose to still believe that God is good, that he is faithful. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is Jehovah Nisi. He is is El Shaddai. He is Yahweh. He is the great I am. So Lord, I pray tonight, God, that you would continue to confirm your word in people's lives. I pray against any cage that has tried to shackle and hold believers back. The cage of fear, the cage of disappointment, the cage of shame, the cage of doubt, the cage of religion, the cage of the fear of failure, the cage of the fear of man, the cage of what other people think about them, the cage of what people said they can or can't do. Lord, I pray that tonight you would unleash kingdom potential inside of people to do and be who you've called them to be. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen. Pastor Gideon.